Okay, we're back at Fordham University with James Fisher, and for the Profile Series today, we're here to talk about uh, Hall of Fame trainer D. Wayne Lucas and his contribution to the game. And to me, D. Wayne, um, he really cha he changed the way that a lot of us started thinking about the way that mm -hmm. barns were going to be run across America. Jim, how, how do you see the way that he, that he brought yeah. something new to the game? Yeah, D. Wayne Lucas was corporate American-style training. And, of course, that's when I was guess, really getting interested in the, in the racing game at that period of time, and I always had this kind of... Uh, temperamental affinity for the older kind of rakish somewhat less polished and smooth and organized trainers because the whole Lucas thing was it was a brand and it was a it was a very very conspicuous style it involved for example he always had the horse being led on both sides of the horse everything was the, the shed row everything was completely almost kind of um, obsessively organized and detailed and corporate and almost almost militaristic in a certain kind of way. Lucas was in a, was that generation. He was born in the mid-30s. He was born on a farm in Wisconsin, so he did have an interest in horses. He started out uh, not with um, uh, thoroughbreds, but with quarter horses, and really learned an awful lot about the business of racing at a kind of a, in a much lower profile setting. He also had a separate kind of formal education. He had degrees in things like physical education. He'd been a coach. One way to really capture a D. Wayne Lucas is that he is the Bobby Knight of thoroughbred racing. In fact, Bobby Knight and Lucas were pretty friendly in the years later. And when, when Lucas would win great uh, triumphs on the track, he'd often talk about meeting Bobby Knight for a, 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 a hot chocolate or a chocolate milk, and you knew they meant it. <laughs> they were guys that were very methodical, really obsessive in a lot of ways. And, you know, their style, not for everybody, but certainly for his owners and for the you know the people he represented, he he delivered uh, extraordinary results for many many years. Well, you know, I think it's I think one of the interesting things about Lucas is is, is that like you said when he came up and you know we got to know Lucas mostly in the '80s, he really mm -hmm. came to preeminence. But he he did bring this more corporate aspect to the sport. But but by the same token, as the years wore on, he grudgingly he won the respect of everybody in the game. I mean, he's just a tremendous horseman. Oh, he really did. There's no question about it. And he seemed to, you know, for the most part, did things the right way. He had, you know, uh, there was one uh, issue on the West Coast involving what appeared to be some drugging of horses, which then they apparently they got out from under, and it may indeed not have in any way have been connected in any, anything intentional at all. So there's no there's no real taint in that respect. But because he, he cultivated, in fact, this much more kind of scrupulous... You know, it really is, in a certain sense, not to play too much of my American cultural religious historian, he kind of represented a kind of a Protestant ethic in the racing game, which had not really been a dominant feature, where, you know, the focus had been on these kind of rakish, rascally characters who also seemed to have an innate genius for handling thoroughbred animals. Lucas's thing was a thoroughgoing, total, 24-7 kind of obsessive almost a kind of a Wall Street, corporate America-oriented way of running his business. Like a lot of people who became dominant in corporate America in the 80s and 90s, he was a self-made figure who had a business model, he had an ethic, and he stuck to it. He was completely consistent and devoted to it, and it paid off very handsomely. Thank you, Jim.